Institutes. Three, two, one. Good morning and good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Janet Tran, and I serve as the director of the Center for Civics, Education, and Opportunity at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. The center works at the nexus of civics and education policy, answering President Reagan's call for an informed patriotism to ensure a more prosperous future for America. So today, I am proud to launch the Reagan Institute's State of Civics series. In a post-COVID world, the priorities of education had come more clearly into focus. And civics, long sidelined for other content areas, is in greater danger of being ignored in a time when perhaps it is most imperative. So understanding the current state policy environment for civic learning and engagement is key to fulfilling the mission of education and strengthening our democratic republic and supporting academic achievement, as well as work readiness for our students. Through the State of Civics series, the Reagan Institute will highlight the work of states and explore exemplary civic learning and civic engagement achievements through the voices of state chiefs, national teachers of the year, and other leaders in the field. These programs will give a general overview of what is happening around the country and will zero in on a case study of the highlighted state and then look at what is on the horizon. So today, we are pleased to feature the great state of Wyoming. Joining us virtually, we have Wyoming State Superintendent, Jillian Balo, a civic education champion and a friend of the Reagan Institute. Good morning, everyone from snowy Wyoming. Wonderful. Additionally, we are joined by the inimitable Dane Weaver, the 2020 Wyoming Teacher of the Year, Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Hi, Dane. Good to see you. And finally, we welcome Dr. Sean Healy, the Senior Director for State Policy and Advocacy at iCivics, to this virtual stage. Good morning from Chicago. A little bit of snow on the ground here, too. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Spring is almost sprung here in D.C., so uh, I, my heart is out to you. Um, Sean, we'll start with you through you know, virtue of its founders, uh, President Ronald Reagan and Justice O'Connor, history just intrinsically bonds the Reagan Institute with iCivics. Unfortunately, we have a shared civic mission as well that keeps us connected. So would you please just give us a brief overview of what is happening in civics around the nation? Um, we know there's been a lot of movement for federal legislation, but what are some key policy levers, and where are some of the bright spots of high quality civic learning across our country right now? Well, thanks for that question, Janet. Uh, so, so maybe I'll, I'll start with Sandra Day O'Connor, and there was a, a very landmark uh, bill that passed in 2010 in Florida called the Sandra Day O'Connor Civic Learning Act, where uh, they required a, a middle school civics class, actually a high stakes test tied to that class, and uh, even factored into, or it factors into to school grades, uh, state appropriations uh, to, to provide teacher professional development. So Florida has been the model for our field for the last decade or so. Um, I was part of some efforts in Illinois where we, we put in place both middle school and high school civics course requirements and resourced implementation with private sources, uh, resources. So implementation is a common theme here. Uh, Massachusetts, the most recent model where uh, there, there's a project-based requirement in place there and the formation of a, a fund uh, that attracts both uh, public and private resources uh, to support implementation once more, primarily in the form of teacher professional development. Uh, more recently, this spring by our count at iCivics, uh, there's over 90 bills uh, in state legislatures uh, in 35 different states 
uh, that, that seek to strengthen civic education in a, a variety of ways. Uh, one, for example, is in Indiana where they have a, a middle school requirement. They'd create a permanent commission uh, on civic education that passed out of their state house a few weeks back uh, with just a single no vote. It was 98 to one. Uh, Georgia is another example. They're, they're trying to put in place a, a civics commission uh, that passed out of uh, committee just, or excuse me, out of their state Senate just a couple of weeks ago, uh, 45 to four. So there's a lot of unity around this. I'll come back to that later. Uh, last thing I'll point to is just last Thursday, uh, Congress uh, dropped a, a federal bill called the Civic Secures Democracy Act. Uh, that has bipartisan co-sponsorship uh, in both chambers, primarily would bring federal funding to states uh, to, to support civic education. So 60% of the funding would go there. Some funding also for nonprofits and for higher education, uh, particularly focused on, on training teachers. So I'll return to some of these, these as we go uh, in our conversation this morning, but a lot of energy, uh, both in state capitals and in Washington with respect to civic education. That's really exciting, Sean, and I hope we don't lose momentum. Now, I'd love to focus on the state we're highlighting today, and I know Superintendent Thalo is really excited to get some of these resources uh, to carry out her vision here. You know, our 44th state, Wyoming, um, you are in your second term as state superintendent, and I'd love for you to share what you and your office have been doing to ensure that students are prepared to be engaged and active citizens in Wyoming. Well, thanks, Janet. And it was it was a treat to hear Sean's intro because there are some common themes, um, including uh, just the bipartisan support for moving forward with a more robust civics experience for our student, as well as some momentum that's built that as states, we can really help to maintain uh, both up to the federal level and down to the community level. And I think in, in Wyoming, I'll just share a little bit about our journey and say that, that we're taking baby steps. Um, you know, I think that there are three things that, um, that as a state, one needs to consider when they're thinking about prioritizing civics education, including policy, partnerships, and the culture of your state, and that really varies. Um, in Wyoming, as well as every other state, there are winners and losers when it comes to civics education. And this is because civics education and social studies have really been marginalized over the last 25 years since No Child Left Behind placed high priority on reading and math. Schools made choices, right or wrong, to reduce social studies instructional time. And what we know to be true and what we share in this momentum effort is that when students learn more about civics in their classrooms and in their communities, they're more likely to vote. They're more likely to discuss politics in school and at home. They're more likely to volunteer in their community and they're more likely to become part of, of community issues and voice their opinions. I think we can all agree today that uh, the Democratic Republic and um, the state of the nation is, is sometimes in, in peril or disagreement. And while there's no single thing that we can point our finger at, um, it is a quickly evolving culture. Um, one thing that as state education leaders, we tend to think about is what can we do in K-12 education? And this is such a big lever for us to think about. Um, in Wyoming, uh, you know, again, as any other state, we look at policy, we look at practice, we look at the, the partnerships that we have. And in Wyoming, we have decided to really focus on a couple of key areas with teachers. One of those being teacher preparation, uh, making sure that our teachers are comfortable with being objective, with their ethics, with original doc documents, and um, understanding that activism isn't necessarily uh, civics education. Second of all, being able to select and discern high quality curricular materials. And that really goes beyond the classroom to the school boards and, um, and policy makers as well. And then as Sean talked about, just a heavy emphasis on professional development. And at this point, high quality professional development exists, but it is not uh, done with a lot of, of uh, fidelity across the state or across subject areas. Thanks. 
Well, Superintendent Bailo, I'm not going to let you get away without a little more bragging about, um, you know, the work. You, you mentioned baby steps, but um, I know for a fact that your state has done a lot of work with um, career and military readiness, and um, you were able to move along an Indian Education for All Act, a really inclusive um, sort of initiative that isn't divisive in, in a time where things uh, that are, are about culture can be divisive. And um, I also think you, you have a... Um, a sort of a movement to, or you know, the, the the engagement of students to visit all three branches of, of government in Wyoming, while half a million people is not scalable in every state. I think it is a model that perhaps other states can look to. So I'm going to press you a little more to share and brag, humble brag more about what's happening in your state. Janet, thanks so much, and that that's hard to do um, because yeah. sometimes I think as policy policymakers, we tend to think really broadly about, um, about the vision. And sometimes, uh, you know, well, we shouldn't take credit for the accomplishments because they're not about us as policymakers in our state, but I'd love to talk about that for just a moment. Uh, we were able, able to, before and during the pandemic and still today, take advantage of a couple of key happenings in our state. Number one is that we just went through a massive capital renovation. Uh, around that capital renovation, we were able to bring um, a, a legislative and executive branch learning center into place. It has a, an auditorium, a classroom with interactive um, opportunities for students to come. That's not quite in place yet. Our Wyoming Supreme Court also through private funding stood up a judicial learning center uh, that again focuses on iCivics and Sandra Day O'Connor's wonderful foundation that she set for students and Americans. So our goal is to have every student in Wyoming visit our state capitol and not only visit the building but interact both through our learning centers and opportunities, as well as with our actual Supreme Court members, our legislators and our elected and um, staff at, in the executive branch. In addition to the capital renovation, we just celebrated 150 years of women's suffrage in Wyoming. And because of the pandemic, uh, we really got good at live streaming. So when students aren't able to be here in person, we've created opportunities for them to attend everything from um, wreath ceremonies by our National Guard to national suffrage, or excuse me, a uh, Wyoming suffrage um, commemorations to the state of the state given by our judi judiciary and our governor and our legislative sessions and committee meetings, all are live streamed and available to students in classrooms. Um, we have worked especially hard with the University of Wyoming and the family of former Senator Malcolm Wallop to develop and start up a civics initiative through the University of Wyoming that is Again, as Sean noted, uh, really gaining some momentum. I've been able to write a couple of books about women's suffrage, about our state and about women leaders in our state. Uh, and we've shared those in classrooms as well. So we do have a lot that's going on. You mentioned our Indian education for all. And I hope to talk about that a little bit later on, but we know that part of civics education isn't just learning about what's happening at the national level, but the most important experiences that our students can get are at the classroom, the community and the state level. Thanks. Well, that is perfect to uh, move right on over to the classroom where, where Dane, you are, uh, you're hiding out in a corner somewhere in school, not in your classroom, because it is your classroom, as I've seen, is covered in maps and very vibrant and students all over the place. But um, how do you, Dane, as an educator, ensure that your students are prepared to be engaged Wyoming citizens when they leave your classroom? Thank you, Miss Janet. Uh, first of all, I got to say that Wyoming is a spectacular place for students to learn and teachers to teach. Uh, what Superintendent Balo um, just, and once again, she she's being very modest. The amount of support we get from our Department of Education is amazing. Um, I mean, weekly, the amount of professional development opportunities that have come out, um, they're overwhelming. And so we get a huge amount of support from our state. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that when we talk about how uh, about the role COVID played and we can get into that more. But on the classroom level, 
you know, um, first off, I'm a 712 social studies teacher, so I'm a little bit different than what we see throughout the nation. I'm teaching a rural school. And so that what that means is I get kids from the seventh grade year all the way up to the 12th grade year. I know what the kids know. And that's incredibly important because one of the downfalls of modern social studies is we have divided up content into these little micro units and compartmentalized all our classes to where they don't overlap. They're almost built to be geography's just geography, U.S. history's just U.S. history. But they all overlap, and it's important to make sure the kids can see that there is a, there is a, 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 a thread that runs throughout the entire content it will eventually lead to a more well-informed citizen. The civics education doesn't just exist in the senior year. It's not the exit ticket for high school, but instead it starts at their earliest understanding of social studies and runs throughout. A really great instance of this is um, right now I have the best seventh grade class. They're just amazing students. And we just got done talking about the election of 1824, which all the history, if you're a history teacher, you're going nuts now because it's our favorite election. Like it's an amazing election. But in order to talk about it, you have to talk about the 12th Amendment. Students have to understand that. Because civics exist in all social studies classrooms. It can't just pop up the senior year. Instead, it exists in early American history. When you go to geography, you're not just talking about this group of islands and the climate here, but you're also talking about world government. You're talking about the government of Britain, the government of France. What does it look like in Japan? When you talk about world history, you speak of the glorious revolution, the uh, English Civil War, so the students can understand the role of the petition of rights and the English Bill of Rights and how that plays into our modern day government. No matter what social studies class you're in, you need a firm basic of civics that runs through the content. So that way, when they students arrive, you know, traditionally senior year, when they're taking their civics course, you're not playing, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. They already know that. That's something that has already built been built in. So instead of teaching the basic core subjects, you're working into how they can be an informed citizen. What's next? Because that's what civics should be called. What's next? You're about to graduate. This is your country. This is your government. How can you tap in? And that's what civics should be. Now, and I understand that I'm in a special place 712, but on a larger school district, these are the conversations that teachers should have in their PLC that they should have in their, in their meetings. What content are you teaching? How are you taking civics? The right hand needs to know what the left hand is doing so that we have a full understanding. So we have kids that are fully engaged in civics education. The second piece, and I'm very big about this, is kids need to know how to discuss issues respectfully. They need to know how to be productive in their conversations. It's something that I know a lot of teachers are scared to dive into because we understand that in 2021, politics can be just a little divisive, just a little bit. And so many people and so many teachers and rightfully, they're, they're terrified to put a foot into debate, into the public sphere because they're scared that things are going to get out of hand. But it's worth mentioning that if we do not teach how to have respectful public debate, then Twitter will. They'll teach them. Twitter will teach kids how to do it. We can't let it go that far. And Twitter is a good platform. I'm not knocking it. But students will learn bad ways of debate to participate with their fellow citizens. So we have to model that for our students because the core of our civic life is knowing how to talk to our fellow citizens and find solutions to our problems, even though we may disagree. And that needs to be modeled in the classroom because that's a safe space that students can go and they can learn to be civically engaged in a safe atmosphere so that when they go out into the world, when they, they go to college or they go to career or they go to military, they can speak to each other in a productive way. There's a host of different other things, but those are the two that I, I am I'm a huge believer in. 
Well, Superintendent Balo, you mentioned that teachers are sort of your secret sauce here, and you can see that uh, Dane is obviously an exemplar. But I do want to jump quickly to Sean here. I know you studied um, under uh, Diana Hess, and if you wanted to uh, sort of jump in a little bit uh, regarding these uh, debating hot conversations, and what the research says about having these uh, tough conversations at an early age before we, we get uh, set in our ways in our middle age. Yeah, so there, you know, there's there's a method to the madness, right? So it's not not just rolling out the proverbial ball, but uh, so it need they need to be structured uh, conversations about current and controversial issues. I really do think it's the lifeblood of the the social studies. So fully endorse uh, what Dane said. But yeah, just a a few findings from the research, uh, and, and I am cribbing uh, Diana Hess. She's the uh, dean of the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin, and this is what she studied over the course of her career. And what she found, she actually uh, most of her study was in the Midwest, so she looked at Indiana and uh, in Wisconsin and Illinois, and she found that in a given classroom, uh, there's actually a surprising amount of political heterogeneity, even in a community like Madison, which is super blue, uh, or uh, in red communities in Indiana, for example. So there's political heterogeneity in the classroom. The truth is, uh, students are still figuring out what they think about a number of issues, right? So they're, they're still formulating their views. And then, yeah, that critical third ingredient, uh, there are, are trained teachers in a classroom with the ability to, to facilitate these conversations. And uh, Dane's absolutely right. We need to uh, learn as a country, frankly, adults are not modeling this well, how to disagree civilly, right? How to build uh, friendships uh, across uh, party lines, across ideological lines. Uh, and, and classrooms and schools are such great places to practice that so that uh, as we become adults and uh, get involved in, in the politics of this country and the politics of our communities, uh, hopefully we can have these conversations uh, and engage in, in uh, uh, what Janet said at the top in the introduction, this notion that, that Ronald Reagan talked about in his farewell address of informed patriotism. Well, great. Um, I'm going to move us to our bleak reality because normally I would be hosting you at the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C., or maybe in Simi Valley, California, at the Presidential Library. Uh, but we are living in amidst COVID-19, a global pandemic, and it has rocked the foundation of our educational institutions and has challenged every formerly accepted notion about how schools need to be run. And Superintendent Balo, your job, uh, I did not envy during this uh, tumultuous year. In the face of all this crisis, um, what were your priorities? And how were you able to emphasize civic education even at all among all of the many other concerns you had? Janet, thanks, thanks first of all for working that question in, in um, to this series, uh, not just as a question, how are you coping, but what are the bright spots? What are the inspirations out of this? And I have to say that civics education really was a bright spot. I talked a little bit about our opportunity to, um, to get better at live streaming and not look at live streaming as a plan B, but a plan A. In many cases, when, when kids can't come here, they can, uh, or go to different areas across the state or nation, they can watch virtually or experience things on demand that we've never been able to offer before. So that's one bright spot. Um, I will tell you that, uh, also I'm, I'm gonna pause here and say that I also taught in a, in a K through 12 school like Dane. And um, there are some times when I miss the classroom, every single time I talk to Dane, I miss the class. I wish I was teaching alongside Dane in a seven through 12 or K through 12 school because there are moments um, in every day when you figure out how to just get things done. And you can see that's what, what Dane does. And that's what I really tried to employ during those early days of the pandemic. I watched my 14 year old son try to do school online. And some of his teachers took the pandemic as a teachable moment to talk about um, poetry that was important to them, to talk about things that were happening nationally with respect to policy. And I took a page from that playbook and did the same. I stood up a series of um, speakers last spring for all Wyoming students to enjoy uh, and take part in. I invited our federal delegation on three different occasions. We had over 300 participants 
sports. We had an author. Um, we also had an Olympic athlete, our governor, and we're extending those into this year. I'm just about to host a Zoom um, discussion with a renowned political commentator who just came out with a book who I can't name yet. And so, uh, you know, the pandemic was an excuse often days to say we can't do that, but the pandemic was also a reason to say we must do that. Civics education was one of those um, situations where daily we said we must learn and continue to serve this up differently to our students in K-12 schools. Um, and as you can see, we have a wonderful ambassador through Dane to, uh, to really build, help build momentum and, uh, and inject Dane Weaver charisma into this uh, every moment of every day. And so we're so thankful. And what we just really hope to do is, is use the pandemic, use the momentum that Sean talked about, use the bills that are, that are uh, in 35 state houses right now, as well as at the national level to just continue to move forward because this isn't about one sil silver bullet. It's not about one teacher or one requirement. It's about a grassroots movement that's starts in the classroom and goes all the way up to the halls of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. Yeah, well, it's absolutely true. Um, you know, I think uh, Sean's probably feeling the same, how we uh, would all like to be uh, next door to Dane uh, back in our, our teaching days. Um, so tell us, Dane, you know, what did your classroom look like before, maybe during the thick of the pandemic? And, and what do you see it looking like after? And, and you know, just tell us uh, perhaps the most important thing, how are your students faring through all of this? Well, that, thank you so much, Ms. Janet, for asking that. You know, you could tell I'm a charismatic teacher. I've been, I've, been, I've been accused that a few times, but I find that, you know, I want my students to be charismatic. I want them to be engaged in the content. I want them to know that the content's not a far distant thing. It, it doesn't exist theoretically. It's it's actual, it's physical. We can see it, we can touch it, it's everything. And so a year ago when the lights got turned off in the school building, you know, teachers across Wyoming, teachers across America, we ensured that while the lights may not be on in the building, they were on in our classrooms, that we were with our students. But now there was an adjustment period. I know um, everybody in America has probably heard this at this point, but we had to find a solution because our kids or what matters. And so we switched, you know, uh, a lot of teachers, we had a lot of uh, teachers who um, were not very familiar with technology and they became experts within about 30 seconds, right? There was a huge transition that was aided by our local districts in our state that, that, that poured every resource they could into our classrooms to make sure that even during the worst of times that our kids still got the instruction that they deserve. And so during the pandemic, you know, we had to learn how to teach differently, how to reach kids, because while in the classroom, you know, I can demonstrate proximity and all those great educational terms, but I had to figure out a new way to teach because this, the way that I've always taught doesn't always translate over the computer screen. And this is where Superintendent Bailo mentioned some of the resources that our state provided. I got to tell you about one. This is the best thing ever. One of the people that she um, that spoke during the series was Representative Liz Cheney. My students got to ask her questions, just, just questions. I mean, how often do students get the opportunity to freely engage? I'm not talking about scripted questions. They ask, she answered. I had never seen that before in my educational career before last year, that she was just, just open discussion now. And my students got to ask questions. And I, I'm so nerdy, I actually filmed it. And we put it on Facebook. So-and-so student asked Representative Liz Cheney, and our, our entire populace, even though we're a small community, even though we know each other, that doesn't happen very often. Do you know the kind of inspiration that provides a student? You know, so Life-changing. It's life changing. So often, especially, you know, on the state level, you know, my state senator lives down the road here. Uh, I got in trouble with my wife because I talked to him at ACE too long. You know, that's very typical Wyoming, right? But a lot of times our students see the federal government as this distant thing that they see on TV, but it's not reality. But then when the students get to sit down on a, you know, on a Zoom meeting and talk to a representative, it's a real thing. It becomes real life. And it is. All of a sudden, that's how we connect um, students to, to our government, is for them to actually see the government. 
talk to our representatives, talk to our senators, get those opportunities. I mean, it was, it was absolutely transformational. My stu students still talk about that opportunity. Absolutely amazing. And as Superintendent Balo mentioned, this is one of the positives that has come out of this. This form of technology is not a plan B, it's a plan A. This is how we connect our students to Washington, D.C. This is how they can see things that only exist in, in pictures and PowerPoints. It's actually live. It is something that they can view, that it opens up a world of, of opportunity for our students and gets them civically engaged while they're still in high school so that they can take that next step, that once they leave our classrooms, they can engage in the society and we need them to engage in that society because they've already done it in our high schools and our middle schools. And so that's one of the things that COVID has brought. To, it has actually brought us closer together, even though distance, physical distance may have grown further apart. We are now closer together because now we can utilize the technologies that were there before COVID, but this forced us into it and we need to push. Sometimes teachers, everybody needs a little push and we got a pretty big push. <laughs> it was a pretty large push that COVID gave us. But in the end, the results on education from COVID they're going to be positive. I have to believe that. And I know that because we now have transformed as a profession into one that, that the world is unlimited. Our students' potential is unlimited and access to technology has been promoted throughout our country and our state. Tinsley, Wyoming, a town of 260, we're one-to-one. -one. We're a one-to-one -one school. Every student has a laptop. That is an amazing thing. And it's one of these things that has happened due to COVID. And so, um, my, my classroom is completely fundamentally different than it was a year and a month ago that I had to change because of, because of COVID, but that change is going to benefit generations of students, hopefully hereafter. Well, I think that, uh, if we don't take advantage of the silver lining from this tragic year, then, you know, it will have been wasted. So I certainly hope that you're still engaging with your representative and giving uh, students an option, not just for a simulation, but actual engagement with their uh, elected officials is uh, something that we ought to keep. I wanna turn the conversation to something a little more wonky, um, a little more uh, controversial, and that's the concept of assessment, um, especially in, you know, we've taken a waiver from standardized testing for uh, a year, and I, I know that some states are looking to potentially take another break. Um, but assessment is instrumental to teaching and learning, and the word itself has become loaded with connotations and conflated with other measures such as accountability. While data from standardized testing, it, it offers one method of measuring the district and school teaching schools and teachers and student performance. It's it's really a snapshot of a student's learning. So, you know, Superintendent Balo, you know, in what ways does Wyoming measure civic learning through our your school's evaluation systems? And how can we ensure that all of our students are, are, you know, they have access to these learning opportunities? Yeah, thanks for the question, Janet. And, you know, because uh, nationally there's been this trend to uh, not make civics education or social studies as much of, of a priority as it was 40 and 50 years ago, one of the places that we started was really looking at our policy framework with respect to standards, statutory requirements, and assessment. Here's the state in Wyoming. Our standards are strong, but may not be implemented with high quality or matched with high quality curriculum mm -hmm. or implemented with fidelity. We have a statutory requirement for civics and social studies education and assessment. Um, however, it's more of an assurance to the state, not a here's our students test score so that we can take a temperature, not only of the students and their success, but also of how well um, that's, that uh, the standards are, are implemented. Nationally, what we know is that low income students have less access to social studies instruction in elementary schools. Literacy remains a barrier for some students in social studies. And at last count, 23% of eighth graders were proficient on, in civics on the NAEP or the, the mm -hmm. nation's report card. So as I mentioned, Wyoming has a requirement for students to be assessed in social studies, but it's a check mark. We have tried and failed three times in Wyoming to make the US citizenship the assessment for high school, uh, high school students. Um, it has not passed our legislature. 
So we remain with sort of a smattering. Uh, lots of schools require the citizenship test, um, but that shouldn't be the end all be all. And I think that's the downfall of injecting an assessment requirement into statute is the assessment becomes the, um, the focal point, not the instruction that leads up or surrounds the assessment. So what I'd like to see for Wyoming and many other states is sort of a light focus on assessment, such as the citizenship, and a strong participation rate and experiential education opportunity, as Sean talked about, through things like We the People, capital visits, the Congressional Award that was supported by President Reagan, um, a AP, a AP class, advanced placement class participation, a portfolios of student and service, um, or portfolios of community service participation, and also our local groups uh, engaging in the process with students. Let me give you just a couple of examples. As I go around as state superintendent talking to Kiwanis clubs and rotaries, I give a call to action that says, do not ever have a function, whether it's a luncheon or a fundraiser or a dinner party without inviting students to be engaged and don't invite the same ones every time. Reach out into your schools and bring those students to your events because civics and citizenship engagement begins at the local level, level. Even before that, it begins at the classroom level. One more example, there's a school in my hometown, Gillette, Wyoming, where uh, the principal worked with the, um, the county clerk and obtained the stickers that said I voted, as well as the actual voting machines that the county used. And they held mock elections and set it up, not just to fill out a piece of paper about or that, that says who you voted for, but where the students actually go and fill out a ballot and the votes are counted and there are speeches that lead up to the school elections and um, there are victory speeches after the election. Students are expected to be ambassadors and speakers for their schools. And that's really how to begin this process. So I'd like us to recognize the importance of assessment to check the temperature of how well the standards and curriculum are implemented, but more importantly, to focus on the portfolio and the engagement around civics education versus the assessment. I love the concept of thinking of it as a, a temperature check because assessment can be very formative as opposed to, you know, long after the fact where, um, my, my former teachers and I, we used to joke that it was an autopsy, not an assessment at all, because it was too late by that point um, for many of our students. I'd love to, you know, zero in right now and go back to Dane. Um, you know, really the question of assessment, uh, if we're asking the right question is just, how do you know when your students are ready for civic life? And I guess the second part I'd love to know is, um, you know, what are some ways education leaders can actually help you measure those opportunities um, that uh, Superintendent Baylo was speaking about? How do we ensure that all of our students are getting those opportunities? You know, with assessment, it's all about, of course, just knowing your students, right? It, it's about knowing exactly where they're at. And you, of course, the problem with any assessment, whether that is math or it's uh, science, is that that starts to become the minimum requirement. You know, that's always um, an issue with a, a long range assessment, such as the citizenship test. That's a beginning, not an ending point. Um, the questions that are on that, and of course, you know, I would, I would love to see some type of assessment, but it's difficult to draw up. And so, uh, because assessment is, especially in civics, it's a doing thing. It's not a fill in the mark, heavy and dark kind of thing. It's not something you can answer in the bubble. It's a conversation you're having with students. It's their perception of what they see and how they can get involved. It's taking that daily temperature check and the talking about the issues and seeing their perspective and them building a, a rapport of knowledge that can be utilized far beyond the classroom and to assess that can be done, but that would be an incredibly difficult thing to do. And it's things like Superintendent Bailo mentioned you know, taking kids down to the, the ballot box and, and showing them the system, how it works. And so that hopefully every time students go and vote, we were going to do that. And then 
their social studies teacher caught coronavirus this year and that didn't happen. That was somewhat unfortunate intensely, but but that's that's an important thing to do, that just to be engaged on the level because it's experiences that we need for our students. It's talking to their local senators, their local representatives, their mayors, their county officials, the dog catcher, whoever it is, but getting them involved in the daily life of our government's what we're wanting out of civics. Because at the end of the day, the, the kids that are in my fifth hour class, there are governors, there are mayors, there are county commissioners, there are teachers, Superintendent Balo, eventually they'll, you know, they'll be our people that we look at for uh, the superintendent of public instruction. These are the kids that we're dealing with. This is a real life thing. This is something we're urged to do and that we have to do. And so as far as assessments, you know, we also have to give some trust to our teachers to allow them to operate and move and, and to do what is in the best interest of their kids because civic engagement looks different. It looks different in Cheyenne than it necessarily does in Tinsley. And so we do have to offer some leeway to our teachers to allow them to make educational decisions because ultimately it's a, it's a local thing, but though we do need accountability to make sure that it is being carried out faithfully um, because a student missing out on civic education is a disaster for our, for our nation and our local communities. It's unconscionable as a social studies teacher they would miss out on those opportunities. Uh, Ms. Jack, the second part of your question, I'm um, dealing with, you know, um, how do we how do we support our educational leaders in giving us these opportunities? And one of them I mentioned is, um, first off, government's an ever-changing thing, right? I mean, it, it is not constant, nor should it be constant. This is the beauty about our government is that it can move and it can function in a, in a society that is ever-involving. And it's just giving teachers, you know, well-rounded professional development to help them. Because a lot of the content we're getting into, especially um, one of my favorite ones, is I'm involved in a program um, that is headed up by Superintendent Baylor's department that is called Level Up. It's a fabulous organization. But one of the things that they spent time is just how to go through and search up Wyoming bills. Look up Wyoming bills, understand the process, just look at that. Well, do our students need to go through there and look at the bills that are passing through our legislature? Yes. Of course, they need an opportunity. They need to know how to understand the system. And teachers, especially in this program, were provided the opportunity to be able to explore uh, exactly how to look up bills and what does it mean and what is this little code over here. And it's in, we think it's instinctual for all social studies teachers, but it's innately not. And so that's a, one of those really good programs that could be provided and that is provided. is teaching our um, teachers how to become better engaged. Um, I, Superintendent Baylor, you sent out a, uh, a memo recently about capital tours, and that reminded me, click, oh, I need to do a capital tour. We need to get on this once Cheyenne melts about six foot off, right? Maybe, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's things hopefully like Hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah, hopefully soon. It's things like that that are great about Wyoming that we do. It's a constant reminder, hey, there's this opportunity for our students. There's this opportunity. Because I'll be honest with you, as a teacher, we get dug down in content, right? I mean, we are so content focused that, you know, I have to provide, I, I get to provide 27 different lessons a week to my students being a, a 7, 12 small school. So, you know, most days I'm going to bed at 11, just finishing up content and getting my lesson plans together for next week. And so those little opportunities are little sparks of reminders. Hey, this is an opportunity. Hey, this is an opportunity. Hey, this is an opportunity. And that alters my curriculum in a massive ways that is, is beautiful and magnificent because it reminds me of doing things that I know to do, but sometimes, you know, March just happens. <laughs> and it's it's an amazing thing that, that um, Wyoming does that it, I hope that every state does. I want to follow up along the veins of, um, you know, ensuring that you have the right information to discern bills. There's a real growing concern um, that Americans are being fed dis or misinformation. And, you know, what do you do as a teacher when you see your students, you know, really buying in or citing information that's a little questionable? You know, what can we do in our schools to help our students discern um, quality news information and the facts between fiction and opinions and biases and really those, that nuance um, that, that perhaps we as Americans are, are lacking these days. Uh, what a what a timely question, Miss Janet. You know, the other night I was, of course, I, I'm so, I have social media like the rest of the world and like our kids do. And wow, 
there's a little bit of disinformation on social media, just a, a small amount here and there, right? And the problem is that, you know, a lot of our citizenry, they, they see it on Facebook, so it must be true. Like my mama used to tell me before, you know, before internet was a, a thing that just because it's on TV doesn't mean that it's true, right? But now we've transitioned to the internet and it's something that we have to do as teachers. And it's not just, you know, social studies, it's English. It used to be all about evaluating bias, right? That was always the big standard, being able to evaluate bias. But now we have to get students to understand that look at your source, look at where it's coming from. Is this a reputable source? Did this website start last night? You know, like what is its bias? Where are they getting their news information? If it's historical, is it cited? You know, it's it's the continuation of what we've always done with bias sources, but now it's of heightened alert that students are, you know, being fed disinformation, whether that is um, when I got my COVID chip being, I mean, get my COVID shot being microchipped. And people ask me that. I was like, I'm not sure that, that I'm, I'm running on Windows 3.1 here. I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, like, I don't believe that's an accurate news source. And unfortunately, people buy into this, and we have to teach our students um, how to discern, you know, false information. And that is all about modeling, right? That's all about looking at the sources and, and pulling information and saying, do you believe this is an accurate news source? Yes or no? Like, why? Like, how do you know this could be false? Or how do you know this could be true? because our students have a tough time. You know, when we were growing up, it was in the newspaper. It was right there. Hopefully the newspaper was correct. And it was either an opinion piece or it was a, a piece of news reporting. But now our kids are being flooded information from 30 different sources and it is hard to discern. But that's our job as teachers, is to teach our kids how, how to intake information in a world that is full of information and in sometimes a world full of disinformation. And so it's one of the most timely conversations that we can have as teachers. And it's something that we're having to adapt to incredibly quickly as teachers. Because this it's is definitely more challenging in this day and age than it was when we were growing up with a handful of news channels. You know, in a country as diverse as the United States, um, it isn't surprising that we don't have a consensus on, on curriculum, nor, nor perhaps should we, um, since I taught in South Central Los Angeles and Sean taught in Chicago and you're in Wyoming. Um, currently, the Wyoming Social Studies Contents and Performance Standards, it does call for strand on citizenship, government, and democracy, as Superintendent Balo mentioned. And um, the goal of the strand, I'll read it to make sure that I have it correct, is to analyze how people create and change structures of power, authority, and governments to understand the continuing evolution of governments and to demonstrate civic responsibility. So I'm gonna ask this to Sean, you know, what is the role of frameworks and curriculum and guidance in civic education, knowing that we are so diverse and you've seen all these states and you've learned a lot more about Wyoming recently. Um, what, yeah. what is the role here? Well, so, so I guess I'll reflect a little bit back on my own experience. I, I led a, a state task force in Illinois to uh, revise social studies standards in, in 2014. Uh, we, we made our recommendations in 2015, and we relied upon this uh, national framework called, called C3, College Career Civic Life. Uh, and it was just that it was a framework. Uh, it allowed states to, to make it our own, uh, and we did that. Um, I, I think the, the, the challenge with C3, uh, so it's a challenge I saw in Illinois and I see it across the country now, is that it largely punted content. Uh, and I don't know what it says about us as a people, but we, we, we really struggle uh, to, to in, in the debates about what uh, we should teach when it comes to specific content uh, in our classrooms. Um, so there was this fantastic uh, project funded by uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, called, called the Educating for American Democracy Roadmap, uh, just released a couple of weeks ago, uh, that, that dives into the content, put together an ideologically uh, diverse group of, of scholars, road tested this with, with uh, 300 different stakeholders. And it is also a framework, so it's something that's not standards. It's something for states to make their own, uh, but, but it does answer the content question. It does provide scope and sequence, which I think is often uh, missing from standards. I can say that was certainly uh, true for C3. Uh, help somebody like Dane out who's teaching 712, so provides coherence uh, across 
uh, grade bands, and it leans into some of these tensions uh, that, that we're having a very difficult uh, time resolving in our democracy. Last thing I'll say, I encourage you to, to go to the website and check it out. Uh, but we've also curated iCivics as part of this project, along with uh, five other organizations, uh, curated content, once again, representative of, of, of the entire political spectrum uh, that aligns with this roadmap. So uh, we're, we're really hoping that, that states give it a look, not just to inform uh, how they write standards, but getting back to an earlier thread in our conversation, talking about how we do assessment, what does accountability look like? We think it looks like uh, the way a school is organized, the way they approach uh, civics, really their strategic plan of action for civics. So uh, we'd love to see Educating for American Democracy schools uh, as a framework, and there to be recognition for schools that do this well and for students that do this well. So to us, uh, that's accountability. Um, but uh, that, that's a long answer to your question, uh, Janet, about uh, framework and curriculum and guidance. But uh, EAD, uh, I, I would put out there, I think it's, it's the right uh, framework for this moment uh, when our country, we're dealing with the, the misinformation that, uh, that, that Dane uh, just, just was, was speaking about, but also this, this deep uh, political polarization uh, this uh, uh, distrust in our democracy and our institutions uh, that frankly, these, are, these aren't just, uh, for long we've worried about kind of high levels of civic ignorance. Uh, this is a threat to our democracy and to its survival. So uh, this is existential. And I, I think this, this framework in particular uh, can be helpful uh, to, to really strengthening the way we do civic education and making this generational investment uh, in our constitutional democracy through young people uh, that, as Dane mentioned, are our future leaders, right? Are the, the will be the next uh, superintendent uh, of, of instruction in Wyoming. Well, I wanna be mindful that there are some audience questions, but I can't um, let uh, Superintendent Balo uh, not address that key to success that she mentioned um, to speak a little bit more about um, perhaps what Sean was speaking about or, the teacher core um, that, you know, you know, ultimately, how does Wyoming provide that professional development um, that, that you've spoken about a bit uh, to in-service educators? And um, how do you promote both the content and the pedagogical proficiencies of these educators? And what does Wyoming do to ensure that those pre-service educators get the content they need and the training they need, as well as uh, more uh, experienced educators like Dane. So we'd love to give you a moment to speak about that uh, before we wrap up with some audience questions. Well, thanks, Janet. And you know, one, one thing that um, has been really important to me throughout all of this is to make sure that it is not a push that's coming from the State Department of Education or a push that's coming from me as an elected statewide um, official, but that it's something that, that really is, is a push from our state. Um, at all levels, classroom, community, uh, regional and state. So one of the things that we did early on was engage as identify and engage as many partners and experts as, as we could. Um, uh, we convened a, a, a small committee of folks from all three branches of government plus a social studies teacher. And we agreed on a common definition of civics education. I think that's a pretty important place for us to start. Um, so that's three branches of government and teachers who are agreeing that in Wyoming, civics education means that it's active acquisition of knowledge, history, principles, and foundations of American democracy in school and through active citizenship. That's pretty broad and it may seem a little bit mundane, but it really isn't. As you heard both Dane and Sean talk, um, you, you know that the principles, the foundations may not have changed, but the way in which they're delivered, not only through professional development to teach or for teachers, but also um, in active situations in our communities where students have opportunities to learn, as well as in our classrooms, that's pretty important for us to at least agree on what that means. Um, you know, as, as far as professional development, I, I mentioned that um, in Wyoming, we have, and this is fairly new, we have a, a, a 
an initiative in our College of Education called E4. And it, I, I won't go into the specifics on what that means. Suffice to say that the, the pre-service curriculum for our teachers in training is pretty robust. And one aspect of that is an ethics course. And ethics isn't just about how to behave as a teacher and a professional, but it's how do you interact with your subject matter in an ethical manner? For civics education, that's particularly important. And as you heard Dane talk, um, it's not just a matter of picking fact versus opinion. It's now a matter of looking at rhetoric, of synthesizing opinions, of keeping an open mind, of being able to have civil discourse with your peers in school, as well as your teachers and community members to really start to shape your own political beliefs. That's supported by so many local, state, and national initiatives that are going on. We have to believe that there are some really great opportunities for professional development to continue, not just through pre-service, but as teachers of all disciplines enter the teaching profession to extend those learnings. Um, you know, we, we have iCivics, we have uh, all of, all of the, the wonderful initiatives that are out there. And really as states now, and as education leaders, it's a matter of synthesizing what's out there and bringing that into our states and to our communities for teachers to, um, to take part of and to take advantage of. I think another really, really important point to make is the role that our locally elected school board officials play in this. Oftentimes, our locally elected school board members uh, get into the position with um, <clears throat> priorities in mind and suddenly become bogged down with accountability, with HR, with budget, and with the like. And all of a sudden, instructional priorities are left to instructors um, and instructional leaders, which is great but the elected voices really need to continue to have a voice in that. So one other injection or infusion part of, um, of civics education is really making sure that there are opportunities for locally elected school board members to identify and encourage high quality curriculum and opportunities within their schools that match um, the values and the priorities and the history of local communities in the state. Um, and that's not something that we often talk about, but it's something that I certainly hope gains more prominence as we move forward with this momentum. Well, thank you so much. I'm gonna jump really quickly. Um, there's a question from the All-In Campus Democracy Challenge and you've spoken, alluded a bit to um, Wyoming not being shy about uh, bringing politics, if you will, into the classroom, but could you please speak a little bit about the efforts in Wyoming to support student voter participation and democratic engagement on college campuses? Sure, so starting in 2017, uh, there was a, a pretty big push by our then Secretary of State uh, called Youth Civics Summit at the University of Wyoming and across community college campuses which brought uh, many college students to the table to talk about many of the things that Dane talked about um, with respect to how do you engage in the process beyond voting. But it didn't stop short at saying, and by the way, are you voting? Uh, oftentimes our youth, um, especially our young adults in college, uh, don't have opportunity, have opportunities to engage civically, but oftentimes don't take advantage of the opportunity that they have to vote. So that's a big part of that. That um, youth civics concept has grown with our current Secretary of State who continues that movement. Uh, there is an initiative called Pokes Vote, which is, um, it, we often call our Wyoming Cowboys the Pokes. And so it's an, an initiative to just register more uh, of, our, of our college kids to vote, encourage them to vote, and encourage them to remain civically engaged. And also, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, we have 
one of the largest scale civics initiatives that is born from our, um, our only four-year university in Wyoming, and it's called the Malcolm Wallop Civics Initiative. Um, that's done in collaboration and partnership with a whole bunch of people, but it's, um, it, it, is, it is nested in our university in Wyoming. So all of those things, again, kind of help build that momentum. And we can't point to one thing that's pulling our, our young adults along to vote and be civically engaged, but we can point to a whole lot of efforts at the state and national level that helps to ensure that. Perfect. We have a question for Sean, um, which you will not have all the time to answer here, but it uh, asks, could you say more about the 90 bills in the states right now? Mm -hmm. Are they all, quote, civic and expansive? Are, any, uh, are there any that are restrictive or the wrong direction, et cetera? Um, so perhaps maybe focusing on the uh, wrong direction and then the ones that you perhaps, uh, you know, have a uh, look forward to or feel that there's a, they are prioritizing civic education. Yeah, there's a, that's a good question. There, there's a variety. Um, you know, there are still nine or 10 states, depending on how you count it, that don't require a civics class. Um, so there's states like Oregon and New Jersey that are, that have legislation that, that uh, would change that. There's a couple like uh, Indiana that I mentioned that don't have middle school requirements. Most states actually don't have uh, specific course requirements uh, in middle school. Um, some are more general. Some deal with with uh, media literacy to get to the, the question that uh, Dane uh, uh, expounded upon. Um, there are a, a handful of uh, naturalization test uh, bills, and uh, our, our coalition uh, isn't isn't really taking a position against uh, legislation per se. Uh, but but I, I have publicly stated before that uh, I, I think it's the right problem, the wrong answer uh, with respect to those bills, but they have taken hold over the last decade in a number of states. Uh, and then the other handful of uh, bills relates to, to uh, uh, culturally responsive teaching, uh, specifically the 1619 project. So there's five or so states that have bills uh, that, that would uh, ban the use of the, the 1619 project uh, in related curriculum in classrooms. But uh, to be clear, the, the coalition I represent, uh, we really only get behind bipartisan legislation. So uh, we, we don't have a position uh, in regard to all 90 of those bills, but uh, work with coalitions at the state level, the states identify their priorities uh, and are, are, yeah, have some really promising uh, bills. I mentioned some at the top, but some of the others in New Jersey and Oregon that, that uh, we are actively supporting. And I think that uh, civics education and civic learning and engaged citizens is something that, that ought to be a bipartisan uh, movement to get behind. So. I just want to extend my deepest gratitude on behalf of the Reagan Institute for um, our esteemed panelists joining us today. We appreciate your contributions, not just to the conversation, but to uh, civic education in general. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So again, today marks the launch of our virtual State of Civics series. Um, join us on April 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our next State of Civics event featuring the state of Tennessee and Commissioner Penny Schwinn. Additionally, please save the date for the Reagan Institute Summit on Education or RISE, which will be held on July 22nd, 2021. Thank you again.